All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the 11 Yanks show. I'm Pete Douthit, as most of you already know. And today I'm very excited to have Barney Schauble, a uh, member of the ownership group of Venezia, as I have just learned. I've been calling it Venezia for the longest time, but as Barney explained to me, it's called Venezia in Italy, so we're going to refer to it by its proper name. Barney, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Uh, fan of the show and excited to have a conversation. Awesome. So, uh, Barney, you know, we see a lot of American investors in Europe investing in, uh, you know, European soccer or football, as they call it over there. And it's interesting to see. What I wanted to get into before we talk about, you know, all of that is your personal journey with soccer. Have, have you been a soccer fan for a while? When did it start? How did you get into the game? Sure. Uh, so my uh, my love for the game goes back to the early 80s, actually, when I was growing up in post-industrial southern Massachusetts. Okay. And, you know, just your classic youth soccer story. My brother started playing as a goalie. I got interested in the game. My mother wound up coaching the first team because nobody in the area knew much about soccer uh -huh. at the time. Uh, my father wound up running the local youth soccer organization. And that was in 84, 85. So my okay. first real memory of falling in love with the game was the 86 World Cup. We actually had to go next door to our neighbor's house to watch it, but watching, you know, Platini and Maradona and getting the Tango Azteca ball, um, it was a huge deal. And so it really led from there. I, I played in high school, I played in the Olympic Development Program, you know, watched, uh, we had a Scottish coach in high school who really encouraged us to watch as much international football as we could. Yeah. And, you know, watching the Dutch team in the 88 Euros, uh, was just incredibly fun and and something that really spoke to me in terms of the game and, and how it operated. My family was more of a basketball family, but I was never going to be tall. And I loved the just the flowing nature of the game, the creativity, the international component. Sadly, when I got to college, I was not good enough to play uh, Division One college soccer, but kept playing since then everywhere I've ever lived, New York, Bermuda, London, here in the Bay Area where I am now, you can yeah. always find a game. And so I continue to play. In fact, we were oh, introduced so still by Jamie Bihani, who, uh, who I play with now. So it's always been something that I've been incredibly interested in and wanted to be a part of in one way or another. And, and that's extended through to my family. That's awesome. So you still play pickup soccer right now? I do more carefully than I used to. Uh, yeah, but, you know, in my late forties, I'm still out there once or twice a week. That's uh, awesome. my kids play. My wife is from England, and so she sadly is very familiar with uh, people spending a lot of their life around football. So <laughs> that led to you know one way or another to our involvement uh, both in Venice and in Oakland. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, what position do you play when you play pickup soccer? Center midfield. So I always liked to be in the middle of things. I liked being a trequartista, sort of close to the front and being involved in creativity and keeping things moving. Um, That's awesome. I have a young son who's 15, who's left-footed. So he uh, plays the left-back position, which every team is struggling to fill. Yeah. Maybe can we get him for the national team? <laughs> we, we're still struggling. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm sure he'd be uh, available if that's what we need. So, <laughs> so you watched in the 80s before MLS even got started, before the U.S. started going to World Cups. And I think 90 was our first World Cup in a long time. Um, what channel was soccer on back then? So, I mean, really, when I was growing up, you would catch some game in black and white from Spain or from South America or from Italy. Mm -hmm. And it was often in Spanish, you know, on Univision or some other UHF channel that you could barely get. So there yeah. wasn't a whole lot of choice. And I think that's one of the obviously biggest changes in American culture is now everywhere you go, you can watch uh, streaming or on terrestrial TV or cable TV. You're, you effectively have an infinite choice of high quality yeah. football to watch and, and even watching my kids grow up where in their lives uh, which certainly wasn't true in my life all of these players are household names all of these brands are easily recognizable mm -hmm. it's very much at the at the core of today's athletic experience in a way that it certainly wasn't you know 40 years ago yeah you touched on something barney um you know just living in different parts of the world where you can always find a game I think it's amazing to me. Like I grew up in Thailand. I was born and raised in Thailand to American parents. I studied in the UK 
I've lived in, you know, India and the Middle East and everywhere I travel, even if I don't speak the language, there's always a soccer game, right? In the park, on the beach, in the streets, and they let you join. And even if you don't, like I remember in Dubai joining a game in the park, I speak zero Arabic, you know, but the, the game kind of becomes the language and it kind of brings everybody together as a global kind of, you know, love and, and language, which I think is really awesome. That's definitely true. I don't know if I assume you probably have, but there's a great book and documentary about this called Pallada, mm -hmm. where basically there's a woman, Gwendolyn Oxenham, who's a pretty well-known uh, writer about soccer who traveled around the world with her boyfriend after college with a ball and basically just went to Japan and um, all throughout South America and into the Middle East playing in a burqa. I mean, so she basically made a documentary film about exactly what you described. And that's the same experience that I've had, which is literally wherever you go. They went to a prison in some South American country and played with the inmates. Wow. Literally anywhere you go, she just showed up with a ball. And especially yeah. as a woman in a lot of these countries, that's not common. No. But, uh, it's a fantastic book and movie where she just describes that exact experience. There's some magic around the sport that isn't necessarily true for any other sport out there. It's hard to go and yeah. find a hockey game or an American football game, you know, on some other randomly chosen country's field. So, yeah, that's awesome. And it's called Palada, you said? Yes, it's P E L A D A. Uh, and it's fantastic. Yeah. So. Okay, I will check it out. Uh, Barney, talk to me a little bit about how you got involved in the Venezia project. Sure. So, a good friend of mine, um, who's now the president of the club, Duncan Niederauer, he and I had a shared history at, uh, at Goldman Sachs. And he knew that I was a big fan of the sport. He had retired from running the New York Stock Exchange after Goldman and had been in touch with other members of the American ownership group that had taken the team over in after yet another bankruptcy uh, when it was in Syria D in, in 2015. Mm -hmm. And after it had been promoted from C and then to B, the ownership group is looking to expand some of the capital that was available. They got in touch with him. He got in touch with me and said, I'm putting together a small group of people who will be a minority investment part of this ownership group. Mm -hmm. And he knew that I loved the game and he knew that my wife loved Italy and has spent summers there and speaks Italian and, and we love Venice and said, this seems like this would be a fun thing to participate in together. Mm -hmm. and, and we agreed. That was uh, not long after they were in Serie B. They were in the playoffs that year. They were relegated the following year. There was a great article about this in Sports Illustrated recently, amazingly about the whole Venezia FC trajectory. They were saved from relegation because of financial irregularities at another club. Mm. And then almost two years ago, uh, there was a bunch of drama around the club and as is unfortunately sometimes typical for Italian football, there needed to be a restructuring of the group and he stepped in to become the president. Okay. And he and uh, some other you know, friends of his or members of that investor group, including me, agreed to sort of rededicate ourselves and get much more deeply involved. So rather than saying, this is an interesting, uh, fun project to observe from afar, it became a project that we were uh, going to be much more uh, intricately involved in. Yeah. And then we had some incredibly good fortune, obviously, as part of that, making the playoffs last year, uh, winning after a, a fantastic playoff run, the chance to be in Serie A this year, which is certainly ahead of the schedule that we had anticipated or even dreamed of. And, you know, he remains incredibly involved there to this day as a very hands-on president. And I spoke to him uh, this morning and he's there for, for this current string of matches. I'll be there in a little over a week uh, to go and watch them play Roma. So it started as one project and it really evolved into something that is certainly much more work, but has been incredibly rewarding and fun. What a story. I mean, they were in Serie C when Duncan got involved, you said, and to now be in Serie A, the, the top division for a club that size, that's, that's, I mean, the fans must be extremely excited. It is an amazing story. There's, in fact, there's one of the players, Marco Modolo, who's the captain, who was with them in D and oh, has wow. actually been with them, you know, over the course of the past six years, all the way up to, to Serie A and, and talking to him last year. And he, I don't know how many human beings in Italy have been through that process. It can't be a, a large number, but no. uh, it's just been a, a magical experience. And frankly, 
one of the things that we were excited about about the whole project is Venice is the city everybody on earth knows of. It's yeah. it's a major city, not just in Italy, but but in the world. And it deserves to have a top class soccer team there in the same way that other major cities you know around the world have that as part of their community and as part of their fabric. And and that's been really important to us. It just feels a very natural outcome for them. And we'd like to to make it something that is not just a a brief experience, but something that, you know, becomes really more uh you know, more part of the city's fabric that they know that they can compete and and draw in the community to enjoy that experience. That's awesome. Um, what is the goal with Venezia? Is it just we need to stay in Serie A? Are, do you guys have ambitions towards maybe European soccer, playing in Europa League or Champions League? And is that realistic for a club that size? I mean, our goal really is stability, right? Our goal is a project that on the men's side, on the women's side, on the academy side, that you can point to and say, this is a consistent um, and and uh, successful enterprise, you know, and, and sustainable in a way where it's not reliant upon a stream of other owners or capital injections, or it's not, it's been through more than its fair share of, of bankruptcy and drama, and to try to just stabilize it and try to make it something that the city is proud of and the whole Venezia Mestro, you know, broader community is part of. And that's really what's most important to us. The clubs that we really admire are clubs like Udinese, who, you know, are just consistently good in Syria. Mm -hmm. You know, it's obviously very difficult to compete at the upper echelons of any of these top leagues, yeah. England or Italy or Spain, just given the unusual amount of money that's pumped into the top of those of those leagues. Obviously, yeah. a model like an Atalanta, we would love to aspire to to replicate someday. It would be fantastic to compete in Europe. It would be fantastic to be challenging for a Scudetto. But I think really, realistically, right now, we just want stability. If we can stay yeah. up this year, stay up next year, be competitive, be entertaining, uh, be something that you know, just hasn't existed in Venice in a consistent way, that's really our goal. And that would make us as as not just the ownership group, but as the the staff and the team, you know, be something to be very proud of. We just like to achieve some stability and make sure that that's now a fixture in Syria in the future rather than just an occasional adventure. Yeah, no, I'm sure. Um, can I ask you a little bit, because this is sort of a trend that we've seen over the last five or so years is American businessmen investing in, you know, European soccer clubs and, I'm very curious as to what is it about European soccer clubs versus, uh, you know, MLS or, you know, the the fixed league that we have here in the U.S. Is it just, you know, a higher barrier to entry in MLS that prevents people from investing? Or what is it exactly in, in the difference for you? Sure. I, I think there's basically there's sort of two ways to think about the answer to that question. You know, at a, at a macro level or just a purely financial level, as you know, the American system is just entirely different than the systems elsewhere, right? No promotion and relegation, effectively a closed league. Most of the owners in that league are also owners of other large professional sports complexes. You know, I grew up in Boston, was, uh, you know, a Patriots fan, which was less fun in the in the 80s than it has been recently. Mm. But the fact that the Revolution are also owned by the Kraft family, you know, that's just a very different model than what yeah. you see elsewhere. And the mm -hmm. lack of promotion and relegation is a big difference in terms yeah. of the opportunity that you then have either to succeed if you're in lower leagues or the, frankly, the focus that you have, you know, if you're in MLS, you look at some of these teams, which have had really long runs of no success, but no repercussions. Mm. It's just a different model than the excitement around, uh, yeah. you know, the dynamism that you see in other, in other leagues. Yeah. So I do think that it, the fact that it's a closed system and the fact that the dollars at play are so large is one of the reasons why you see investors. There's not that many people out there who can write a check for 300 plus million dollars just for the opportunity to then spend money on a team in a stadium. Right. And, you know, right. Just as the price of entry. As an example, a team in Serie A was just purchased for you know, less than a third of that. Uh, and wow. That's, that's a team that has... Uh, the longest history in Serie A, actually, like the first game played in the 1890s was, you know, in Genoa. So oh, wow. uh, I think it's just a different model. 
Yeah, so, I mean, I, I didn't realize that there was that stark a difference. I mean, for a hundred million, you can get a Serie A you know, team. And, and so that's at a purely financial level. I think that's what's driving it. You know, if you have an interest in the sport or in professional sports, accessing the NFL or the MLS or the NBA is you know very rarefied air in terms of mm -hmm. the people who can who can do that. And it's not typically driven by a love of the sport. It's driven by a, a capability as a billionaire to access other assets that help you in some way. Mm. I would say, though, at a, at a more personal level or at a specific level, you know, for me and for Duncan and for the other members of the ownership group of, of Venezia, and the same is true in, in our other project here in Oakland, it isn't really being driven by those same dynamics. You know, what's the best way to turn a dollar into three dollars? That's not really why, you know, we're involved in this. It's really because we love the city of Venice. We love the sport. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly fun to be involved in, in making something uh, better. And so it's less driven by a cold hearted calculation around, you know, where's the best return on the optimal amount of money, obviously participating in a, buying a club that's out of bankruptcy and starts in Serie D and gets promoted or is in Serie B when we came in and is looking for additional capital is a wildly different financial proposition than, you know, uh, paying for or appealing for the next MLS franchise. But mm. so it's riskier, uh, obviously, but it also has the opportunity for, you know, a very different experience. Yeah, I'm sure. I don't know how involved you are in the recruitment side of uh, the club, but, you know, this summer we saw Venezia sign three young Americans. We have Gianluca Busio, the American Italian kid. Uh, we had, you know, as well as uh, Tanner Tessman from Dallas and then Jack DeVries, who I believe is in the academy. How much of those purchases are familiarity uh, at being Americans yourself and how much of it is, you know, marketing potential to an American audience and how much of it is just value for money? It starts with talent, right? It starts with quality. So one of the things we tried to do, and this was covered in, in good detail in some pieces that are out there about Venezia, but is really try to take an analytical approach to say, you know, where can we find the best talent? And that may sound obvious to somebody who's, you know, read Moneyball or been paying a lot of attention to, you know, the use of analytics in U.S. sports. It's less true in, in other leagues and other countries so far. There's still a big bias, understandably, in each country, England, Spain, Germany, Italy, towards local players, a very historical way of doing things. And we were trying to be creative and thoughtful and said, let's identify players who maybe aren't in the next town over or aren't on loan from a competing team. Let's see, can we go out and find quality players in other places? And if you look at the first year, we really tried to do that. We found somebody in Austria and somebody in Norway. And we, through that same screening of what are the best and most attractive players out there, you know, Gianluca Buzio was obviously one of the people on that list. I don't think he was particularly interested in coming to a Serie B team. Mm. Uh, but when we realized the good fortune that we had last year, that changes the tenor of those conversations and say, look, if you come here, you definitely have the talent to play and we would leave you to come. But he was yeah. one and, and Tanner is the same, though Tanner obviously is, you know, hasn't seen as much of the field yet. We're, we're big believers in the talent that he has. They were part of a much larger effort to identify mm -hmm. people, somebody from Wales and, um, you know, all across Europe and all across the world, frankly, you know, we obviously just brought in this Argentinian goalkeeper to help us where we've had some injury problems there. We're really looking for quality and value more than we're looking for marketing specifically. Are we delighted that, you know, Jean-Luc has settled in as smoothly as he has and that he is obviously, a, you know, a fantastic, charismatic player and a, a young American? Yes, that's great. But that wasn't the goal is to say, how can we find somebody who looks a certain way or appeals a certain way? And the conversation that we had with him and with his family was, you know, we think you can succeed here and you can help us as a club, but it will also be an opportunity for you to be playing against top competition week in and week out, uh, which has yeah. obviously been the case. So the marketing is a nice offshoot. Yeah. You know, it's fantastic to be able to say to I do find it funny if you tune into Paramount Plus, you know, the ad for Venezia each week is like, come watch these two American players yeah. Um, yeah. on this team that, that's in Serie A. But that wasn't the goal. The goal was 
to find the best possible team and simply yes. to be more creative in assembling that team by finding uh, players that might be undervalued. And, you know, hopefully that that is something that we can continue to do over time. Do you think that Americans in MLS represent value for money? Like if you took a Gianluca Busio and, you know, at his age and talent level playing somewhere in Italy, would he then be more expensive just because of where he's playing? Or do you think it's about value for money? Well, I mean, I think in his case and, and in, in Tanner's case, I think we felt like there was value there, right? These are good players. They're young uh, and with the right experience, you know, they certainly you know, a can be valuable to the team on the field and b over time you know, have the potential to appreciate in value. I think if you found, if, Jean-Luc, when he'd gone back one summer, had stayed there and come through the Brescia program, and you're trying to buy him at 19, he would certainly be more expensive right. uh, if he was exactly the same player, which it's not clear he would have been. Um, yeah. You know, and that's true in all cases, right? You see this, it's well known in the Premier League as well. You know, local English talents, you know, is just going to be more expensive in the Premier League than somebody who grew up in Tennessee or California. And that's just, there are lots of reasons for that, which are good and bad. Yes, but yes. And I do think it's been helped by the success that we've seen American players have. You know, as, as we all know, there was a checkered history of Americans moving overseas for a long time. And the yeah. fact that that's really changed, you know, starting with with Christian Pulisic, obviously, but moving on to uh, Weston McKinney sort of coming into Juventus, you know, from yeah. Dallas and watching that and Tanner watching that and FC Dallas watching that and saying, OK, you know, there is a path here. This is a legitimate opportunity. And, and now, you know, as you know better than anybody, the number of Americans who are playing, you know, in real teams and real leagues across Europe is fantastic. So there's a self-perpetuating component to that, which yeah. is you know, really good for the U.S. men's national team, but also really good for the sport. So Yeah, for sure. Do you think it, that changes perceptions of Americans and soccer, as we call it, in Europe? Because, like, I studied over 10 years ago in Cambridge, England. I got my degree in coaching. Uh, coaching football specifically. And I remember being, remember being the only American in the class and everyone looking at me like, what are you doing here? You guys don't even understand the game. And, and just, you know, seeing over the last five years, the amount of Americans succeeding at high levels in Europe, do you think that that changes people's mentality about Americans and, and the game and how we can actually play and coach and be a part of it, you know? Absolutely. No, I, I think that's absolutely the case. Uh, and I think you're seeing it. Look, there's, it's a global market for talents and you're seeing that's the case. You know, in the Premier League, if you were from Japan or China or Korea, you were seen as a marketing ploy, you know, you just signed somebody to sell jerseys, but now you look at, you know, some of the players that are there where they're clearly there on talent alone. It has nothing to do with a, a marketing. And you know, I think there's absolutely a very different recognition of, of American talents and American capability. And part of that was our system was different. Part of that was a lot of these players went to college and then went over afterwards and were older. And all of that has changed, you know, with the advent of the MLS academies, with the advent of Americans who are spending more time at a young age in very competitive situations. So I think it's absolutely true if you went back in time 10 years and went to a, a typical technical director in Italy or in Germany and said, would you like to consider this group of young Americans? They were much less interested in that than they are today. Yeah. Do you see uh, Venezia being a place that you know could sign more Americans in the future? I mean, we hope so. We think that would be great. But, you know, the downside of the dynamic you just described is if everybody all of a sudden is outbidding for Americans and they become very expensive, then you know, maybe, we have to, uh, maybe we have to look somewhere else. But, you know, we're very proud of the fact that we have some Americans and, and Canadians in, in the program. We're building underneath the first team, what we think is a very competitive under-19 team uh, where those players really can compete to get into the first team. And frankly, that's one prong of the approach we'd like to take is finding international talents. The other prong is we've underinvested in the Veneto region historically. Uh, we haven't necessarily attracted all of the best players who grow up in, in the broader Venice area. And we want to do that too. We want people coming through the academy and yeah. coming through our youth program. We recently hired a fantastic uh, guy who's come over from the Barcelona Academy to help us think about how best to do that in Venice. And and that's important too. You know, we certainly don't want a team that's just of attractive value, uh, non-Italian players. You know, it's really important to have Italian players in the team, and we'd love to have players who grew up in the region, 
who maybe came to the Penzo when it was sold out and we beat Fiorentina a couple of weeks ago and you're 14 and you think, oh, I'd like to do this. Yeah. We'd love for that man or that you know woman to come into our team and be able to make us competitive. So that's a much longer time frame type of exercise, but yeah. hopefully in five years and 10 years, we're starting to see the results of that. That's great for the home crowd too. When they see a hometown boy step onto the field, you know, as, as one of them, they love that. Um, sh shifting focus for a second here. I know that you've mentioned several times you're involved as well with the Oakland roots in USL. Tell us a little bit more about that project, how that got started, what the goals are there. Sure. Uh, so in some ways it's obviously very different, right? It's a USL team and, um, it's, a, it's certainly different than being in Syria. In some ways it's a very similar story, you know, actually not long after I started getting involved in Venezia on the investment side. I started to be contacted by some people here in the United States about football investments. You know, it's a small soccer world out there, and largely in California. And, you know, my answer to people was, if there's something very local, that would be fascinating. It'd be fun to be part of something that, you know, isn't on the other side of the, of the world. But there doesn't really seem to be an opportunity for that. And so then I was approached by some young founders is a group of four or five young individuals here in the bay area who really felt like there should be a professional soccer team in oakland mm. and they had very good reasoning you know unfortunately oakland has been somewhat abandoned by its professional sports teams recently the raiders moving the warriors leaving oakland and going into the city um maybe even their professional baseball team relocating or leaving so they saw a vacuum there in a again a very vibrant city in a lot of ways oakland and venice are totally different mm -hmm. but in a lot of ways they're similar they're very cosmopolitan colorful creative artistic somewhat underappreciated from a professional sports standpoint and so it felt like there was an opportunity there and for me obviously just being able to drive across the bridge and go and participate and and be at the games and be at the training sessions seemed like that could be a lot of fun mm -hmm. we started in a an independent league nisa uh, and we'll always be thankful to them because it was a great way of getting up and running and testing out. Will people come to see games? Can we find a place to play? Can we appeal to the community? And we did, and we had the opportunity last year to move into USL, which has been great. The USL championship as the second division effectively of, of the United States, a lot of very competitive teams, a lot of really, um, excellent programs, you know, 32, uh, legitimately strong football programs all across the United States, being able to participate in that and play against, you know, the Tampa Bay Rowdies and Phoenix Rising and some of these other really high quality, um, you know, clubs has been fantastic. And it's been yeah. a huge learning experience. It's been a, a first year that obviously had its challenges with the pandemic and with a whole host of other issues, but it's been fantastic. And Obviously, there are lessons that you learn from one project, which you can apply to the other. In each yeah. case, being part of the ownership group, but also being involved a little bit on the technical side and and having some insight into what it takes to have a long term project succeed. You know, in each yeah. case, you know, what we would love is we have a game tomorrow night. This is the last game of the season. If they win that game and results elsewhere fall in our favor. We'll actually make the playoffs in the USL. There'll be five and a half thousand people there tomorrow night. Very That's good. really fun. You know, that yeah. didn't exist at all in Oakland. There was never really a, an appetite like this or a venue like this for professional soccer. So seeing that live and, and uh, having the opportunity to plant seeds for the future, yeah, it's the same ultimate goal there. Five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the community is proud of having a team there and it, add something to that community and it's sustainable you know again it's it's something that's really fun and and um rewarding to be part of that's awesome you know we've heard rumblings recently about usl considering the possibility of some form of promotion and relegation at least between its two leagues usl and usl2 do you think that a you know ownership groups within usl are open to that possibility and b if that does ever happen would it be a good step towards maybe re rethinking how we do soccer in America? And if you see the popularity of it growing as a result, do you think that that could then get other investor groups, even within MLS, thinking about, you know, maybe this sport is is done a little differently than other American sports, and maybe that's not a terrible thing? 
Absolutely. It, it certainly is a topic that's been discussed, right? It's, it's, you know, as you well know, there's a lot of people on uh, who are kind of virulently in favor of, of this development in the United States. And I would say within the ownership group, like when within the, the broader ownership of, of the USL, like in any group of, you know, 30 plus people, there's a whole range of opinions, but it certainly is a topic that people are aware of and have thought about and, and, or trying to think about what the what the best answer is. The easy thing to do is to to leave the system as it is and to say, well, if MLS is not going to change, what's the point? Right. Uh, personally, I think it would be exciting to get there, even if it's in an intermediate stage, even within the USL, if you start to have in between League One and League Two and the championship, some offer of promotion relegation. Leaving aside our own position, you know, within Oakland. I do think that would make people pay more attention. It would be exciting. Right. It comes with a lot of complications. You know, there's stadium size requirements or the ownership requirements or the professional uh, atmosphere requirements are wildly different, right? If you're, but the same is true in, in many leagues, right? The same is true right. in, in Spain or in Italy. You know, we spent an enormous amount of time and a, a Herculean effort to upgrade the stadium in Venice to be suitable right. for Serie A for this year. So I do think there are, complexities like that if you're a fantastic league two team and you win league two and you win league one and then you're in the championship two years later can you digest those changes can you digest what is required from a fan and tv and professional experience i don't know that's that's hard yeah but it seems worth a try to sift through some of that so i have no idea whether usl as a league will uh choose to go in that direction but i do think the prospect of it is exciting it comes right. with a lot of unexpected wrinkles. It's not a simple thing to put into place. No. But um, you can certainly envision a path where that works. I think obviously the real question is, does that ever penetrate the top league or not? Or right. does the USL championship become something that is competitive with that top league from a, a quality or, or viewing standpoint? I, The sense I get is it's very unlikely that would happen between now and 2026. You know, FIFA is yeah. obviously very excited about the impending World Cup here, you know, as are we all. I think any dramatic changes in the MLS structure seem unlikely. Yeah. But if you look at the FIFA rules, it's very clear that promotion and relegation is what's required for every country. And the U.S. Yeah. has benefited from sort of a gentleman's exemption from that. Maybe that will be the case forever or, or maybe not. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of promotion relegation. I just think it adds something diff, you know, different to the game. Games of consequence are not just in playoff, you know, or or at the top of the table, but at the bottom of the table. And and then also like you, you know, the dream of a team like Venezia who can start off in Serie B and you know work their way up, like that is so exciting. Whereas you know here, if if you have a club in Nisa, you know maybe you can get into USL, but that's not because of promotion relegation. But that's kind of it. You know, you can't get promoted to MLS right now. But the dream of a Oakland Roots, for example, if we had promotion relegation, where with the right investment and the right amount of time and the right thoughtful approach, could even one day be playing in MLS in the top league, I think would be super cool. But Absolutely. It's hugely motivating, you know, even as a possibility, just as a dream. Yeah. And the other thing that I've been interested in is there's a lot of commentary recently on the other end of it, which are you have these teams in every sport, you know, basketball, baseball, MLS, who are just languishing, right? You know, they're they're underperforming, they've underperformed for years, they can't find their way out of it, whether it's bad luck or or bad fortune or bad investment or bad management or all of the above. Yeah. And fans there are also disgruntled. You know, like yeah. what's the point? Why am I going to continue to show up when there's no real stakes here yeah. and nobody seems to really care? And so so I think the the motivating factor is an important one, but also the the pressure factor of mm -hmm. if you don't want this slot if you're not really competing for it and there's another team which really does want that slot and can outperform, now that's ultimately the core American philosophy, right? There should be right. some some reward or or punishment based on your behavior. Yeah. It's just more meritocratic. So yeah. you can see why the spirit of that really appeals to people. The mechanics of putting that into place are a little bit more complicated. So. For sure. For sure. I remember attending Chicago Fire Games when I lived in Chicago for three years. And just, I mean, it's a huge sporting city, right? Massive, uh, you know, young, uh, urban sort of audience, very, you know, Hispanic audience. Like, 
it, in principle, it would be the great place, you know, for an MLS team, but the fire just are so terrible for years now, 10 years, probably <laughs> that. And it's so disheartening. Even for me, I'm a passionate diehard soccer fan since I was five years old. So I would go to games just to support local soccer. But even for me, I was like, why am I doing this? You know, yeah. like, and it's crazy. So I do agree with you that at some point, you know, there does need to be some pressure that like, Hey, if we don't step up our game, we could lose our spot in this league period. Yeah. So if you think about the fans, if you think about the players themselves, you think about the people who are employed at these franchises, you know, that, that really is motivating, obviously, and uh, exciting and, and frankly draws in more viewership and, and more attention. You know, there's nothing like a good relegation battle and, and having been in some of those, you know, it's obviously incredible. The stakes are incredibly high and people yeah. are really riveted by that. So I'll be curious to see how it evolves. But for now, our focus is just, you know, again, in each case, find some stability, find sustainability, generate a relationship with the community where, you know, they understand what is on offer and they're excited about it. And sort of the league dynamics and TV deal dynamics and promotion relegation dynamics, you know, it would be great if, if we can wrestle with those in the future, but we have more immediate uh, things we want to focus on now. Yeah. So, you know, you, you touched on 2026 a little earlier, um, looking at where soccer is headed in this country as it's clearly growing very quickly. Um, there's massive, massive interest, especially among young people. Um, where do you, as an investor and as a fan, where do you think we're going in the next five, 10 years? I mean, do you think we could ever crack the top three in terms of popular sports in America? Like wh what's your projection? It's a good question. You know, I think, I think it depends upon two things. I think there's the trajectory of soccer, football as a sport, which feels like it's inexorably continuing upwards, right? Mm -hmm. There's just more interest at a youth level, uh, for men and women, obviously, uh, in the United States, for boys and girls, when I watched it with my own kids growing up or in high school now, you know, even if you don't play it at a collegiate level or at a high school level, most people now have played it at one point or another in their lives, you know, at least yeah. conversant enough with it that they're happy to go to a game or watch a game on TV. You know, it's much more baked into the fabric of people's lives now than, than it ever has been. Yeah. And there's just high quality soccer in a way that it didn't used to be. And I remember going to watch you know, the Metro stars when I lived in New York city and it was not a great experience and they were not a great team. And, you know, it wasn't that appealing. Whereas now if you're going to a Sounders game or you're going to, you know, an Atlanta game or an Oakland roots game, it's incredibly fun. You know, it's yeah. a fun night out. There's a lot of passion there. The quality is way better than it used to be. Yeah. You know, we had a, a goal scored by one of our defenders that was on ESPN, you know, because yeah. it was a clever volley and, the fact that there's any soccer on ESPN is fantastic to me. Alone. <laughs> you know, this is somebody who's at, in a second division, you know, non-playoff game, but it was just incredibly skillful. And so that's now being broadcast to people around the world. That's great. So I do think that trajectory is important. But I think the answer to your question about could it be one of the big three is also dependent upon the trajectory of the other sports. And I think if you look at the other main historical sports in the United States, you know, basketball obviously just continues to um, do fantastically well in a way that it, you know, frankly, hasn't always over the course of our lifetime. So if you view them as sort of untouchable in terms of engagement with the audience, the question really becomes, what do you think happens with the NFL and with Major League Baseball? You know, mm -hmm. if kids, and I live in Northern California, which isn't really mainstream America, but if kids are, fewer and fewer children are playing baseball and American football, if the sports themselves are struggling a little bit with either injury issues or or um, length of game issues or or analytics issues or whatever it might be, it really depends. If you think the NFL is going to be an even bigger force in American life in 10 years or Major League Baseball is, then that leads you to one conclusion. Yeah. But I think there's an argument to be made that if you leave basketball to the side and you look at American football, baseball, Hockey obviously is its own separate community anyway. Yeah. Uh, that there is an opportunity. You could certainly paint a picture if you wanted to to say that in 2030, soccer and basketball are you know, two of the biggest sports in America, and the others wow. are are waning. Who knows yeah. if that comes true? But I think yeah. it's it's not inconceivable. 
I think also it's hard to to point to MLS as evidence of, you know, where soccer stands in this country because there are many, many soccer fans in America who don't watch MLS, right? They'll watch European soccer or they'll watch Liga Mekis. I mean, Mexican so- the Mexican League is still the most popular or at least the most watched sport on television in America. Yeah. So sometimes when I have discussions with people and they point to MLS, I say MLS and USL both are just one small part of a very large soccer audience in this country that I personally don't think gets enough credit um for being as large or as passionate as it is and certainly if you see the hispanic fan base you know the hispanic demographic in america is the largest growing one and tends to be a soccer loving audience if that trajectory continues as well as all the kids playing soccer now i kind of agree with you by 2030 we could be a very very large sport yeah and i think that's an excellent point because i mean i know lots of people who will watch every champions league game they can and may not go to their local mls team right yeah Partly because it's easier, you can do it from your living room, but partly also because, you know, it's just a different quality of game, obviously. And so, so I do think that's underappreciated, that upswelling yeah. of, of just interest in watching the game and then how that translates through to who plays and what local attendance is and, and frankly, the strength of the U.S. You know, men's team as well. Yeah. I guess also a lot depends on how the national team performs because the national team at World Cup tends to is be the sort of starting point for a lot of people getting into soccer. You know, even people who don't love soccer pay attention uh, when there's a World Cup because it's America, right? We're a patriotic country. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, obviously attendance for those games will be through the roof, you know, when when it is here. Um, yeah. But that may, having that goal in mind saying, look, these players that we now see, whether it's Gianluca or or Weston or others, you know, knowing that they have a legitimate shot at participating in that 2026 team and watching them now, I think people will feel much more engaged. It's not, oh, hey, meet these people you haven't heard of. The World Cup starts next month. It's now a, a trajectory that people feel like they're participating in, which is exciting. Yeah, for sure. Just briefly on the popularity, if somebody told you 10 years ago that a, in a major market in America, the soccer team would outdraw the NFL team, would you have believed them? I think it's unlikely. I don't yeah. think I would have believed that for sure. Um, and but obviously the NFL's had its travails. You know, I think there yeah. are a lot of people who are just out. You know, given the concussion staff and given the there's a never ending stream of other bad news <laughs> coming out about American football in one way or another. Um, yeah. So I don't think I would have believed it just because there's a real hold, obviously, on on generations where this is just what they do and what they did and what they watch and what they gamble on and what have you. But I think like many things, you know, I don't think the younger generation is quite as, as wedded to that. You know, yeah. if anything, they're watching, you know, the red zone and thinking about their fantasy football teams. They're not necessarily engaged in a team experience. You know, and so right. that, that changes the dynamic a lot. For sure. Yeah. I was kind of referring to Atlanta there where actually, you know, Atlanta United does outdraw the Falcons on many occasions, which is unbelievable. And I think it's amazing. You know, what they've built in Atlanta on the field, off the field is fantastic. Uh, and that's like an example where, you know, the ownership has done just a, an incredible job of, yeah. of building a project that's, that's enviable everywhere. So those are absolutely bright spots. You know, I think even if you just said forgetting about their relative performance to, to the NFL team, if you just said in Atlanta over this time frame, here's what's going to happen, that would have been really hard to, to sign yeah. on to, to believe. But I think it's amazing. Well, Barney, thank you so much for coming to chat with us. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss or bring up? Not at all. Thanks for having me on. Really glad, team, you made the introduction. And, um, you know, I just think it's you know, for all the things that we talked about, you know, as a a fan of the game. I think it's fantastic to see where we are and where we're going. So appreciate everything that you're doing to uh, encourage people to pay attention. So, Well, thanks a lot, Barney. I will be, wa- I watch all of uh, Venezia's home games just to keep an eye on the Americans there, but now I'm even more, you know, excited about the project having spoken to you and I'll probably be paying attention to some o- Oakland roots games. You guys are also shown on ESPN plus. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. They're on ESPN plus and, um, we uh we're looking forward to next season this first season has been fun and we're excited to have done you know well enough to be competing for a playoff spot but i'm i think next year we'll have our our feet firmly under us and and uh even more to look forward to but yeah absolutely appreciate it and let me know if there's uh if you want to get out to oakland or to venice for a game anytime that would be awesome thanks a lot barney you have a great weekend and i'll talk to you soon thanks you too